Hi, I'm Graham Reed, and in this session, I want to talk about um, freedom from the orphan spirit. Uh, this has come about following um, some talks I've done recently, um, using my own testimony to talk about uh, my journey, particularly in the in the last eighteen months or so, where I have found freedom from this myself, and. So I've been talking about it because it's something I've become passionate about. Now, this session um, describes a step by step approach to how you can be free from the orphan spirit. So you can either use it as a teaching session or I've built in some break points where I've used the word Selah or remember that um, David, when he was writing some of the Psalms, put break points in his psalms to encourage people just to stop and reflect in those moments about the words that precede those cellar break points. So we're going to have some of those points in, uh, in this session. And if you want to use the session as a workshop, then you can. And those points are built into the session so that you can just stop the video for a little while um, put on some soaking music or just allow it to be quiet and take some time to be in the presence of God because it is always God's spirit that works in our hearts, not the preacher, not the teacher, not the speaker. And there's no sense at all in which I'm presenting this session as any kind of an expert. I'm only wanting to share my own experience, my own testimony. Uh, and I strongly believe that we can be free from orphan spirits. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. Um, you'll see that I, I've um, on this first slide, there are two books that I want to recommend. John uh, Eckhart's book, Deliverance and, Spirit, uh, and Spiritual Warfare. It's a really helpful book. It uses scripture to describe um, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. And um, The Orphan Heart, which was also a really key book to me as I went through it step by step and found um, that it just helped me on my journey. Um, so yeah, so the first thing I want to do is just provide us with a break point right at the beginning of the session, a cellar point um, where we can just welcome the presence of Father God into our, into our midst, into, into your presence wherever you are whilst you're watching this. Um, if you want to see the preceding talks to this session, then if you type in my name, Graham Reed, on YouTube, and then the word orphan, you'll see that there are two talks uh, that come up. One is uh, just an introduction to this session, and uh, the other is a preach uh, that I did, which describes in some detail um, my own testimony leading to this session. So. You can listen to those if you want to. But what I want to encourage you to do first is just to welcome the presence of God and ask the Holy Spirit to direct you as we're in this session together. I love this uh, verse from Scripture from the Passion Translation. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being. You are God's beloved child. And I want to talk about deliverance not as an end in itself, um, but the real end to this session is about finding the Father's embrace because um, that is the positive thing that we're heading towards. And this verse describes that. Just for a few seconds then, switch the video off Take as long as you need to, just to welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit, to welcome the Father's presence, and to be ready to take the next step. So for a few seconds, I just want to relate back to my own story, um, because one of the things that we need to do if we are going to be free from this orphan spirit that I want to talk about in this session, is to acknowledge where that orphan spirit has come from. And first of all, I want to say this. When I talk 
about the orphan spirit. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about a spirit that comes from God's enemy, a spirit that wants to bring damage into our lives, that wants to steal something very important from our lives. It's a demonic force and it affects us even as if we are followers of Jesus. And I want to try to describe how that can happen. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, there's that beautiful verse which describes God's position before we receive him into our lives. There it says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. And God is like that. He stands outside our lives and recognizes that we have the right to choose whether we invite him into our lives or not. And he knocks because he wants to have access into our lives. And for any of us that are followers of Christ, then there was a time when we heard that knock and opened the door and God flooded into our lives. And I believe that when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. I believe that the presence of Jesus and the presence of the Father step into the front door of our lives and become the primary owners and occupiers of our lives. And it's very important that we understand that right from the beginning. But I want to describe something else which just helps to explain what I'm talking about in this session. I want you to imagine that although what I have said is true, that there can also be some side rooms, as it were, in that house, which are shut away from the main part of the house. Those side rooms have a door that is locked. And so God occupies the main part of our house, but there are still rooms that are shut away from him. And it's as if those rooms have doors or windows which open to the outside into the darkness. And those doors and windows to the outside provide access for God's enemy to come in and to do damage in our lives. And it's really important for us to understand if we're going to be free from this orphan spirit that I want to speak about now, that we understand that he can have an influence in our lives. It's as if that orphan spirit comes in, occupies that dark side room. He can't get into the rest of the house, but he wants to push lies under the door. And we come along and read those lies and allow those lives to begin to take root in our hearts and in our minds. So I want to explain a little bit about what, how that can happen. And I want to relate it to my own testimony. If you've watched one of the other sessions, you'll know the full story. But um, my story is simply this. I had two very loving and caring parents who loved me very much. And I loved them too. But damage came into my life, I believe, because I was separated from them um, from, for most of my childhood. Um, we lived in Central Africa. My parents were missionaries and I was five years old, only just five years old when I was sent away to boarding school. And uh, there were long terms in those days, 18 weeks, two, two terms a year. <clears throat> so for a five year old, 18 weeks is like a lifetime. And I remember the day that I was sent away to school. I'd been back to school and seen the bed that I slept in. I remember my parents coming in in the evening after I'd gone to bed. And I remember my mother's tears. And I remember my own tears and what it felt to be torn away from them in that moment. How painful it was because I knew as they were saying goodnight to me that actually they were saying goodbye and the next morning they would be gone before I got up. And so what happens in a situation like that is that you tend 
to build a shell around yourself because of lack of uh, parenting. And um, that damage is what opened the doorway into that side room for me, into the darkness outside. And what I believe happened was that this orphan spirit was then able to have access into my life. It was a demonic influence and it came from God's enemy. Now, I want to put that aside in one minute and say this about God. God is wonderful and he has chosen to relate to us in lots of different ways. That's why in the New Testament, when we read the New Testament, we find that Jesus is described in many, many different ways so that we can understand some of the different aspects and facets of his nature and his character. But we also find this very important thing, that God has also chosen to reveal himself to us as a father. And for us who have had that knowledge of God as a father in our lives, all the way through our lives, it's no big deal really. But when the disciples came to Jesus and said, how should we pray to the Father, or at least how should we pray to God? Jesus said, you should address him in this way, our Father who is in heaven. And actually for the disciples, that would have been quite mind blowing because up to then the Jewish people had always thought about God as being distant, as being really quite frightening, somebody that you couldn't look at because if you did, you'd die. Somebody who, um, you know, hated sin and had to be almost placated, so all these sacrifices had to be offered to him. But now Jesus was saying, look, this is a new phase in our relationship with God. He wants to reveal himself as a father. And the disciples began to learn what that meant. Now, in the New Testament, there are two different words that are used for father. The first word that's used for father is pater. It comes from the Greek, and it's the word that's most commonly used for father when, when it's describing God. And it's a, a word that Jesus used a lot. And Peter simply means the one who is the provider, who is the protector, the one who brings discipline into our lives, and the one who gives identity to our lives. Because if God is calling himself father, then he is calling us his children. So it doesn't just give us a new understanding of who God is, but it also begins to bring a new understanding to us of who we are in his eyes. And so there's that wonderful truth, but there's something even more wonderful about God being a father in the New Testament, because we have this other word used for father, which is Abba. And the word Abba simply means daddy. And it generally describes the relationship between a father and his small child his child that is vulnerable and, and, and small and weak, it describes a very intimate and precious relationship. And as we go on, we discover that this idea that God wants to reveal himself as a father is very precious to God because it describes how he wants to relate to us. Look at the story of the prodigal son which is really the story about the father. And that story tells us so much more about Peter and Abba. It's little wonder then that when God's enemy saw that, he, that God was going to relate to his people in this way, it really, really angered him. He hates the idea of us being fathered by God. And he really, really hates the idea of us being abbed by God. So God's enemy will do everything he can to steal away and destroy that idea of us being fathered, hence the orphan spirit, and one of his big tools for stealing that feeling away.
And I've come to understand that there are many Christians like me. I've been a Christian for nearly 60 years. But you know, you can live your whole Christian life and know, know, know that God is your father, but never feel that you've experienced his embrace because that orphan spirit wants to do everything it can to steal away that relationship. So that's why I want to talk about that a little bit more now. The first thing we need to do if we're going to experience freedom in this area is to acknowledge the source of our damage. And you may be listening to this now and know that, yes, actually, there was damage in my life that came through my father or perhaps through my parents. And I feel as if I have that orphan spirit too. I want to talk very briefly then about the symptoms of the orphan spirit. If you're asking yourself, well, is this true of me? Then maybe this will help you a little bit. Because that orphan spirit, if he dwells in that side room, then he will bring a whole load of baggage with him, a whole load of lies which he'll push under the door, which will he will want to take root in our hearts in order that he can destroy that relationship between father and child that God wants for us. So we are unable to feel God's presence. We know that he wants to love us, but we can't feel his love. He's like a distant uncle. He's not like your daddy. And quite often there's a real strong sense of spiritual loneliness that people have if that orphan spirit is affecting them. So God is more like an idea than a daily experience. We learn about him at church. We read about him in the Bible, but we never experience his presence in our lives. If there's damaging, if there's damage in our parenting, particularly in our fathering, then what happens is we we build this shell of protection around ourselves. We lock our emotions away. And the effect that that has on our relationship with other people, with ourselves, and particularly with Father God, is that actually we feel separated from him. We see other people enjoying him, but we feel separated. We feel rejected by him. We feel like we're being pushed to the edge. We feel marginalized, not only from God, but even when we're meeting with God's people, we feel like we're on the edge of things. We don't feel that we belong. And then envy and jealousy can be a problem as well, because an orphan is somebody who sees that other people have got something that they don't have. And so when we see people succeed, when we see people doing well, then instead of wanting to encourage them and to push them upwards, envy rises up inside us. It's, a, it's something that is involuntary almost. It, it, just, it just rises to the surface. And jealousy is the immediate response we have when other people succeed. When things go wrong in our lives, then we have a tendency then to blame other people instead of taking responsibility for things in our own lives. It can't be our fault. It must be somebody else's. Generally, we have a sense of low self-esteem because we feel separated from father, because we can see other people are closer to him. We don't feel that we have any value. So we have low self-esteem. In other words, we don't think much of ourselves. And we don't think that anybody else thinks much of us either. And we don't think that God thinks much of us. So we end up trying to um, <clears throat> make ourselves feel worthwhile, acceptable by doing things. Quite often people with an orphan spirit are very hard at working in the kingdom of God. Because underneath it all, they're trying to prove that they're worthwhile to themselves. They, they try to prove that they're worthwhile to other Christians around them. And in a way, they're also trying to prove that they're worthwhile to the Father, even they, though they know in their heads that that doesn't make any sense. 
because we're worth everything to God without doing anything. When God describes himself as Abba, he's describing a father who loves a tiny infant who hasn't done anything. It's just that they're loved for their very existence. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. But some people who have that orphan spirit, they feel homeless. They feel spiritually homeless and they don't feel that they belong. Quite often that leads to people wandering from one church to another, from one group of Christians to another, and they never feel that they belong in those places. And after a while, they become dissatisfied and blame the group or blame people within the group for it, and they move on somewhere else. That's somebody with an orphan spirit. There's a great sense of self-pity, and there's a sense of lack of identity and not of sonship. Sonship is something that can be completely understood in the head and completely unfelt in the heart. And finally, uh, quite often people with an orphan spirit have um, problems with addiction and obsessive behavior. Um, and all of those things are, are the enemy trying to tell us that we'll find satisfaction somewhere other than in the arms of our daddy. So the orphan spirit is the enemy's replacement for the spirit of adoption. Let's go back to that analogy of that little room shut away from the presence of God, shut away from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus and from the Father. And a room that the, the orphan spirit has access to. For you have not received a spirit of slavery says in Romans chapter 8, leading again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, sons, by which we cry, Abba, Father. So that room where the orphan spirit dwells, that he has access to, is used so that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption, which is another name for the Holy Spirit, doesn't have access to at the moment, because the spirit of the orphan, who is a demonic spirit, is dwelling in that place. And what God wants to do is replace that demonic spirit with his own spirit so that we can begin to experience a new intimate relationship with the father. And as we've already discussed, incomplete or corrupted fathering leaves space for the enemy. Consciously or unconsciously, we open the door to the orphan spirit. And this might sound a little bit shocking. Or it might sound unfair. <clears throat> but what happens is that usually unwittingly, when that damage occurs in our early lives, that's when we open that door to allow the orphan spirit to come into our lives. And for me, I guess it was when I was separated from my parents, when I was torn away from them, and I began to try and cope with living in a world apart from my parents. I was 18 before I lived regularly with them, and all through my childhood, they were like an uncle and an aunt. In those very early days, when the damage was done, I was actually making room in my life for the orphan spirit to dwell. And it would have been unconsciously done, but still it's something that we need to acknowledge. He occupies the space that God intends for the spirit of adoption. And he sows lies into our hearts. He pushes those lies under the door into the main part of our lives so that we begin to take them on board and allow them to grow in our life. So I want to give some space now um, for you just to reflect on what I've been talking about. Some of this might hit quite hard. And the scripture tells us that it's the Holy Spirit who's our teacher. So it's not what I'm saying, but what the Holy Spirit's saying that really counts. I want you just to take a few moments, switch the video off, 
put some music on again, or just sit in quietness in the presence of God and reflect on the things that I've been talking about. Ask yourself, is this true about me? And if it is, just take some time to rest in the presence of God. There are better things to come. As part of this journey that we're on in this session, there are some important steps that we need to take. And some of them might sound a bit shocking. I encourage you to turn the video off at any point and take time to reflect. You may need to do this over several days, or you might just want to do it in one session. There are three things here that I want to mention very briefly. The first is, do you want to choose freedom? I've spoken to people who are affected by familiar spirits. I know what that's like because I've been affected by familiar spirits myself, particularly this orphan spirit. And when I've talked to those people, after a while, it becomes evident that actually they don't want to be free from that spirit. They're not ready for it. Either they're afraid of what life would be like without that spirit, or somehow they feel that by keeping that familiar spirit in their lives, they're punishing the person that abused them. I know that might sound strange, but that's one response that people have. So I'm asking you now, do you want to be free from this afflicting spirit? The prize is intimacy with the Father. Then the second thing I want to say is this, that we need in this process to be prepared to confess. Confess just means to, to speak out. And it's not such a scary thing. It sounds like something dreadfully scary or somehow religious. But in this sense, we just need to speak out to God what the truth is. And for you, that might be just to stop the video again and to say to God, God, when I'm listening to this, I know that this orphan spirit has been afflicting me. This is me. That's confession. That's just saying, this is where I'm at. I acknowledge it. And I'm speaking it out in your presence. And when you do that, you're laying a foundation for freedom. And then thirdly, perhaps the most shocking, is to repent. In scripture, when it talks about repentance, it's simply talking about turning away from something. And there's a challenge to us in this journey, in this process towards freedom, where we need to turn away from that orphan spirit, to turn away from the symptoms that I've been talking about, to confess and say, God, this is me. And as a part of that confession to say, God, I'm sorry, that at some point in my life, I've opened that door, I've opened that window so that the orphan spirit has, access, has had access into my life, a part of my house, if you like, that should be occupied by you, has been occupied by this spirit. And I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that I allowed access for it. And I'm choosing in this moment to turn away from that spirit and to turn away from these symptoms, to turn away from the lives, lies that have controlled my life and to turn towards you, Father. Because repentance at its very most basic meaning simply means to turn around. That means to turn away from one thing and to turn towards something else. So again, you might just want to take a break to ask yourself whether you're prepared to do that. And, and maybe just quietly in your own heart to speak out to the Holy Spirit. And I just want to mention this briefly. Up till now, we've looked at the idea of damage coming into our lives through uh, incomplete or corrupted fathering or parenting. But sometimes, the orphan spirit can have access to our lives because of damage that was done in a previous generation 
and was never dealt with. So perhaps if a parent or a grandparent experienced damaged fathering or damaged parenting or, or being orphaned in some way and never understood how they could deal with that situation in their own lives, lived their whole lives without dealing with the orphan spirit, then that orphan spirit can be passed on to the next generation. So sometimes these things come down to us through our family line. And maybe the Holy Spirit is showing you now that that's something that has happened to you. In which case, again, it's good to switch off the video at this point to take a few moments to acknowledge that um, so that we're acknowledging the source um, of that damage where the orphan spirit has come into our lives. Then we also need to be ready to turn away, to repent from bitterness and unforgiveness. In my situation, the damage came, but it came from unwitting, loving, caring parents. I was not abused in any way by my, by my parents, as far as I can remember. But it was that separation from them that brought the damage. But for some of you, as you're watching this, you'll be able to recall situations, events that have happened in your life that brought terrible pain and were the result of abuse. And abuse comes in many different forms. But as we're going through this session, God will be reminding you about those painful times in your life. There might be just moments of abuse that happened that come back to you so clearly. Or it may just simply have been that toxic relationship where there was no approval, no love expressed, where a parent was present, but they weren't really involved with you. They, they just took no notice of you. And because of that pain, bitterness has come into your life and unforgiveness. And part of preparing ourselves for being delivered from this orphan spirit is to be prepared to forgive. And I recognize that for some people that will be a very difficult thing to do. And forgiveness always begins as a choice rather than a feeling. So it may be that the best you can do in this moment is simply to tell God, God, However I feel about that person, however I feel about that situation, in this moment, I choose to begin to forgive. Because forgiveness isn't something that lets the other person off. Forgiveness is not primarily so that the other person can find freedom. The main reason for forgiveness is to set ourselves free. Because until we forgive somebody, that other person, that situation has power over our lives. Even if they've forgotten about the abuse, they still have power over our lives because of unforgiveness. When we're able to forgive people, then we cut ourselves off from that power and we set ourselves free. And that freedom is essential if we are to deal with this orphan spirit. So again, I'm asking you now, is there any pain left? Is there any unforgiveness left from what happened to you? And you might need to take time to tell God that you want to forgive, even if it's just a single step to say, I want to forgive. Then God will hear that and you're positioning yourself to be delivered from this orphan spirit. As we go through this process, then God will begin to want to plant more truth into our lives. He will want to take out the lies and replace them with his truth. And I have uh, another sheet, another session about that which I'm not going to include in this session. But the question now is simply this, 
Are you prepared to have those lies rooted out? Rooted out from your heart and your mind so that the truth about you, which is that you are a beloved son or daughter of Abba Daddy, can come close to you, can embrace you? Are you prepared for those lies to be weeded out so that the truth can be sown into your heart and not just your mind? Deliverance might sound like a fairly scary subject to you, but actually deliverance is just about us being free. And demonic influence in our lives is not some weird thing that happens to bad people. It's something that can affect us all from time to time in our lives. And we all need freedom from these spirits. The scripture says that we're in a spiritual battle all the time. And part of that spiritual battle is for us to be delivered from these familiar spirits. So I want to talk about how that can happen for us. The good news is simply this. It's what God wants for us. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, it says the son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And again, it's not talking about some vast battle on a faraway battlefield. It's talking about the works of the devil being destroyed in our own lives as well. So we know that it's what God wants for us. He wants that room that is occupied by the orphan spirit to be cleaned out. He wants that orphan spirit to be pushed out of the door so that he can flow in and begin to bring healing into our orphan hearts. Secondly, Jesus bought the right for us to be free through his blood on the cross. We know that when Jesus died on the cross, it, it was for our salvation. If that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be able to open the door of our lives and to receive Jesus, to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive the Father into our lives. That wouldn't have been possible. But we also know that Jesus' death on the cross bought so much more for us than just our salvation. He bought the right for us to be free from these spiritual powers. The scripture says this, God, the apostle Paul wrote this, God wiped out the charges that were against us. That's talking about our, our sins. He took them away and nailed them to the cross. There, Christ defeated all powers and forces. He let the whole world see them being led away as prisoners. So I want to say this, that this scripture reminds us that these spiritual forces, these demonic forces, which we sometimes think are so powerful, are not as powerful as Jesus. They have been destroyed by him. And the scripture says that because of Jesus' death on the cross, because of the authority that Jesus has taken over these spiritual forces, he has now passed on that authority and that power to us so that we too stand above those spiritual forces so that if there are demonic influences in our life, they do not have as much power as we do because we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. So sometimes we think that these demonic forces are, are bigger and better than we are in some way or bigger and worse than we are in some way. How can we possibly have victory over them? The truth is that the word of God reminds us that we have been given all authority to deal with these things in our lives. We have the same authority as Jesus to command spirits or demons to go. I have given you, this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, I have given you more power than he has. I have given you power to crush his snakes and scorpions under your feet. Nothing will hurt you. Yes, even the spirits obey you. So we can be encouraged because even if we've had that spirit afflicting us for all these years in our lives, we know this truth that we have the authority and the power to throw it out. 
affect our lives anymore. And we do learn in scripture that as we do these things together, that we are bringing different spiritual authority together in order to achieve freedom in our lives. Matthew 18 verse 18 says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So what this verse is reminding us is simply this, that when we act within the will of God, when we pray and act within the will of God, then we are joining forces with the authority and power of heaven. So when we agree that we want to be free from this orphan spirit, when we agree that we want deliverance from that orphan spirit, then we are agreeing with heaven. We are drawing on the authority and power of heaven, and we are drawing on the power and authority that we have because of the cross. And those two come together. And that, uh, that spirit, that orphan spirit, that familiar spirit is going to have to go because he is afraid. He is afraid of the authority that we have. He is afraid of the authority and power of heaven, and he will have to go. And then in Matthew 18, 19, it says this, if two believers on earth agree about anything that they ask, it will be done for them by, the, by my Father in heaven. Did you see? It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So here the scripture is talking not just about us joining forces with heaven, it's talking about us joining forces with other believers. So if you like, there are three of us joining forces here. There is heaven. There are the believers, two believers or more that come together to agree. When that happens, then we have the authority to achieve great things. And there is no demonic force on earth that is great. Three forces coming together. I've come to the end of the teaching section in this session, but I want to spend some time praying with anybody who has reached the point where they want to be delivered from this orphan spirit. And you can either switch me off and just spend time talking to the Father yourself and also telling that spirit where to go, or we can do it together. And I would like to stand with you, knowing that we have heaven on our side and to tell this orphan spirit where to go so that you can be free from it. Let's just take a few minutes to pray. Father, thank you that you want to be my pater. Father, thank you that you want to be my Abba Daddy. I feel such a sense of indignation. that we should have lived for so long in the faith and had that sense, that feeling of being loved by the Father stolen from us. I feel a great indignation about that. Thank you, Father, that it's your purpose for us to be set free. And we do not presume to lean on our own authority or power, but we believe that we have the authority of heaven, that we have the authority of Jesus and the covering of his blood. And because of that, we know that we can speak to every afflicting spirit and tell it where to go. And so in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, 
and by the authority that we have from Jesus and from the Father, we say to you, orphan spirit, you have no place in my life. This room is no longer yours. And I command you to go. I command you to go now in the name of Jesus and with the authority he gives me. You are to leave this room. You are to move back outside into the darkness that you came from. Out through the door, out through the window. And from now on, you have no access into my life. I speak to you in the name of Jesus and I command you to go. I command you to go in this moment in Jesus' name. And as we're speaking out these words, then I can see that dark room. I can see the shape and shadow of that afflicting spirit. And I can see that even with the words that we are using, that spirit is being pushed outside. It's being pushed outside. And as I stand in that room, I look towards the door in, into the inside of the house and I can see that the door is framed with light. A tiny crack because the door has been closed for such a long time. But as we agree together to command this spirit to go, I see that door beginning to open. Beginning to open. And the presence of the Holy Spirit, like a flood of liquid gold, begins to flow into the room and everything is changing. Because with the presence of the Holy Spirit comes the presence of Jesus himself. And all his love and authority and power he flows into that room of the Holy Spirit. And the last residue of darkness and shadow that has dwelt in that room is being pushed out, pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. He is making us bold. And he is reminding us of the authority that we so that the last remnants of that dark shadow, that spirit pushed out into the darkness. We are able to command that spirit and we say to you, spirit, you will not come back. You do not belong here. You have no access to this room. And we welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit into this room. We welcome the spirit the presence of Jesus. And I want us to imagine for a moment that the Father is there too. I know in scripture it describes Jesus as being a man, as having the body of a man. And God is, is not a man that we can, can see him in a human body. But I want you to imagine for a moment that Father God is there, standing there like a papa. And in this moment, he doesn't just want to be Peter. He wants to be your Abba. And you are standing there in the room as well. But in this moment, God has made you young again. The little boy or the little girl that you used to be. Maybe in those times which are so hard to remember. In the times of neglect and abuse. Uh, there you stand again, but this time your daddy, your Abba is there, not the abuser. Your Abba is there and his arms are wide open. And as his presence flows into the room, the room now is full of light. 
the darkness is gone. The room is full of light. And the father stood in front of you with his arms open. And there's nothing left for you to do. All that's left is for you just to be. There's nothing left for you to do. Then the father can embrace you, puts his arms around you. This is what was bought for you when Jesus died and rose again. This is the prodigal son's father embracing his son, his daughter. So excited to be wrapped around you so that you can feel his love. And my prayer for you is that this will be a breakthrough moment. No breakthrough is an end in itself, but that it will bring a change, a permanent change in your relationship with God. And as the Father begins to teach you the truths that you've not been able to believe or feel in your heart, then he will ensure that that door is locked to the outside so that orphan spirit never has access again. Take some time to be in his presence and to stand in his embrace. Take some time to be quiet or to put soaking music on again. Whatever works for you. But don't hurry away from this moment or for this light that God has brought for you. Very happy for you to contact me if you want. I have a sheet that I can send people, which is a sheet full of truths. The truths that come and replace the lies that the enemy has planted. Somebody told me that when you evict a bad tenant, and that's what we've been doing in this session, doesn't necessarily mean the room is tidy. And it takes some time after the orphan spirit has gone for the orphan heart to heal. But I'm happy to be in contact with anybody who wants to know more about that. May God bless you.